throughout time, people across the world told each other tales of how they came to be, of heroes and monsters, romance and tragedy, death and rebirth. Mythology helped shape the ancient world, explaining the unexplainable. This is Mythology Unleashed. Perhaps no other Greek god was ever as feared as Hades. Grim and foreboding, Hades, the god of the dead and of riches, ruled the land of the dead with unquestioned authority. While not an evil or malevolent being, as many believe, or even particularly cruel in comparison to other gods, Hades was still kept at an arm's length, even by the other gods, for he was still seen as cold, gloomy, and merciless in his judgment. But how did Hades come to be? And just how did he become the king of the afterlife? Hades was the firstborn son of the titans Kronos and Rhea in the early days of the universe. Kronos, who had usurped his father's throne, was fearful that his children would rise up and overthrow him just as he had done. So to prevent this from happening, Kronos swallowed Hades shortly after he was born. Kronos would repeat this gruesome act to Hades' siblings Poseidon, Hera, Hestia, and Demeter. It was not until Zeus, the youngest child of Kronos and Rhea, grew to power that Hades and the other siblings were freed from their father's stomach, all fully grown and ready to fight. And so began a war between titans and gods that resulted in the fall of Kronos and his regime. And so began the reign of the Olympians. The three sons of Kronos, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, divided their rule by drawing lots. Hades, having drawn the short stick, ruled over the realm of the departed, a realm that would come to share its name with its grim monarch. Once situated within the underworld, Hades seldom ever left its confines, sitting contently upon his throne. The most prolific time he had ever left the underworld centers around his abduction and subsequent marriage to Persephone, the goddess of the spring and daughter to Demeter, the goddess of the harvest. As the story goes, Persephone was frolicking in a meadow when the earth cracked open, and Hades, riding a large chariot drawn by black horses, whisked her away deep into the realm of Hades. Demeter searched tirelessly for Persephone, neglecting the growing world she had loved so much, and plunging it into a deep winter. It was not until the intervention of Zeus that things were put to right. As Persephone had consumed pomegranate seeds during her tenure in Hades' domain, she was to spend a month of the year for every seed she had eaten in the underworld with Hades. So while she was with her mother, the world would be warm and plentiful, with flowers blooming and crops bountiful, but when she would return to her husband, the world would gradually go cold and plunge into winter. From Hades came the Greeks' interpretation of how the seasons came to be. Unlike most other deities of the Greek pantheon, Hades seldom ever interacted with mortals. When he would, however, the common factor was a mortal who had tried to outsmart him or cheat death. The result was invariably in Hades' favor. One such account was that of Sisyphus, a king who had angered Zeus and managed to trap Thanatos, the Greek god of death. When he finally died, he proclaimed to Hades that his wife had not performed the proper funerary rites, thus disrupting the procession of the underworld. Hades ordered Sisyphus to return to the land of the living 
to set things right. Sisyphus managed to escape death once more and did not return to Hades. That is, until he died of old age. Once more, Sisyphus was in the realm of the afterlife. But this time, there was no tricking the god. Hades threw Sisyphus to the bowels of Tartarus, where he was condemned to roll a massive boulder up a steep hill for all eternity. And each time he would reach the top, the boulder would roll its way back to the start, so the trickster would have to begin all over again. Another example comes during the tale of Orpheus and Eurydice, after the latter had died after being bitten by a venomous snake. Orpheus, whose beautiful music could soothe and enchant all who heard it, made his way through the caverns of the underworld safely by playing his lyre. Enchanted by the dulcet tones of Orpheus's lyre, Hades permitted Orpheus to take Eurydice back with him to the land of the living. The caveat? Eurydice was to follow Orpheus out of the underworld, and Orpheus must not turn around to face her until they are both out of Hades' domain. As the pair walked on, Orpheus' anxieties overtook him, and just before they reached freedom, he turned back only to see his beloved wife whisked back into the underworld. Orpheus was barred from entering again, and once again Hades' word was final. Lastly was the case of Theseus and Pirithous, the latter of which planned to enter the underworld and take Persephone for his wife. Hades, well aware of their plan, offered hospitality as a ruse. When the pair sat down for a feast, snakes wrapped around their feet, Hades had trapped them for their audacity and arrogance. Theseus was eventually rescued by Heracles, better known as Hercules, but Pirithous remained trapped for all eternity on the chair of forgetfulness. Though not evil, or needlessly cruel as many believe him to be, Hades is nevertheless powerful. When he wants something, it is his. When he is slighted, his retribution is great and absolute. And these attributes, in addition to his gloomy abode and intimidating aura, made him not only well respected, but widely feared by the human populace. He was seldom depicted in art, and almost never prayed to. Hades' power and dominion over the denizens of the afterlife made him more than a little frightening, but every bit necessary to the natural order. <laughs>